अम्मा संबुदसा नम तस भगवत वह तो सम्मा संबुदसा Homage to him, the blessed one, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one. Welcome to our Wednesday night class. We are uh, having. Uh, we'll tell you as we go along. We are going to be working on suttas here that reflect questions that we're also going to be working on 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 Sunday in the early afternoon with. Um, the Australian group and people are coming in from different countries to that one too. So it's going to be fun because we sent a survey out and uh, at first eight people came back with 13 topics or pieces they wanted to have explained. And then um, there was another few people that came and added a few more. So we have a nice list now. And I think the first one is going to be talking about the seven lengths of dependent origination and how to use that for a tool in life. And that you, you got a taste of that in the workshop. So let's start with the sutta. I sent a copy to everyone. If you have it, you can follow along. This is from the long discourses. And this is the Buddha's advice really to the lay people. And Sigalika was a layman. And then we start the sutta here. This is what I heard. On one occasion, the Buddha was living near the town of Rajagaha at a spot in the bamboo grove called the squirrel's feeding place. And you know, I always get a chill when I think about that because when squirrels are just running around on the roof all the time and you think about how noisy this must have been all the time with the squirrels and the nuts going around like crazy. At that time, a young householder named Sigalika, he arose early and set out from Rajagaha with freshly washed clothes and hair with palms together held up in reverence. He was paying respect towards the six directions. That is east, south, west, north, lower and upper. Mm, that sound familiar, uh huh? Okay, if you got to the six directions, you know what's happening. Meanwhile, the Buddha dressed himself in the early morning he took his bowl and robe and went into Rajagaha for alms round. On the way, he saw Sigalika worshiping the six directions. Now seeing this, the Buddha said to him, young man, why have you risen in the early morning and set out from Rajagaha to worship in such a way? Dear sir, my father on his deathbed urged me. He said, my son, you must worship the directions. So dear sir, realizing, honoring and respecting and holding sacred my father's request, I have risen in the early morning and set out from Rajagaha to worship in this way. But young man, the Buddha said, that is not how the six direction should be worshipped according to the discipline of the noble ones. Then how, dear sir, should the six directions be worshipped according to the discipline of the noble ones? I would appreciate it if you would teach me the proper way that this should be done. Very well, young man, listen and pay careful attention while I tell you. Yes, dear sir, uh, agreed Sigalika, and the Buddha explained, young man, by abandoning the four impure actions, a noble disciple refrains from harmful deeds rooted in four causes and avoids the six ways of squandering wealth. So these 14 harmful things are removed. The noble disciple now with the six directions protected has entered upon a path 
for conquering both worlds, firmly grounded in this world and the next. At the dissolution of the body and death, a good rebirth occurs in a heavenly world. What four impure actions are abandoned? The harmful, the harming of living beings is an impure action. Taking what is not given is an impure action. Sexual misconduct is an impure action and false speech is an impure action. These four are abandoned. This is what the Buddha said. Summing up in verse, the sublime teacher said, harming living beings, taking what is not given, false speech, pursuing the loved one of another. These the wise surely do not praise. What are the harmful deeds? The causes of these harmful deeds, going astray through desire, hatred, delusion, or fear. The noble disciple does harmful deeds, but young man not going astray through desire, hatred, delusion, or fear. The noble disciple does not perform harmful deeds. That is what the Buddha said. Summing up in verse, the sublime teacher then said, desire, hatred, delusion, or fear. Whoever transgresses the Dhamma by these has a reputation that comes to ruin. Like the moon in the waning fortnight, desire, hatred, delusion, or fear, whoever transgresses not the Dhamma by these has a reputation that comes to fullness like the moon in the waxing fortnight. And what six ways of squandering wealth are to be avoided? Young man, heedlessness, caused by intoxication, roaming the streets at inappropriate times, habitual partying, compulsive gambling, bad companionship, and laziness are the six ways of squandering wealth. These are the six dangers inherent in heedlessness caused by intoxication loss of immediate wealth, increased quarreling, susceptibility to illness, disrepute, indecent exposure, and weakened insight. If you have any questions about what these things are, you write a note and ask me at the end, okay? Now, these are the six dangers inherent in roaming the streets at inappropriate times, oneself, one's family, and one's property are all left unguarded and unprotected. One is suspected of crimes, and then rumors spread, and one is subjected to many miseries. These are the six dangers inherent in habitual partying. You constantly seek, where's the dancing? Where's the singing? Where's the music? Where, where are the stories? Where's the applause? Where's the drumming? These are the six dangers inherent in compulsive gambling. Winning breeds resentment. The loser mourns lost property. Savings are lost. One word carries no weight in public forum. Friends and colleagues display their contempt and one is not sought after for marriage. Since a gambler cannot 
adequately support his family. These are the six dangers that are inherent in bad companionship. Any rogue, drunkard, addict, cheat, swindler, I mean, somebody that steals, cheats, or thug, becomes a friend and colleague. And these are the six dangers inherent in laziness, saying, it's too cold. One does not work, saying, it's too hot. One does not work, saying, it's too late. One does not work, saying, it's too early. One does not work, saying, I'm hungry. I'm too hungry. One does not work, saying, I'm too full. One does not work, with an abundance of excuses for not working. New wealth does not accrue and existing wealth goes to waste. This is what the Buddha said. Now, summing up in verse, the sublime teacher said, some are drinking buddies and some say, dear friend, dear friend, oh, dear friend, but whoever in hardship stands close by, that one truly is the friend. Sleeping late, adultery, hostility, meaninglessness, that means just talking about stuff all the time, and important stuff. Harmful friends, utter stinginess, these six things destroy a person. Bad friends, bad companions, bad practices, spending time in evil ways. By these, one brings oneself to ruin. In this world and the next, seduction, gambling, drinking, singing, dancing, sleeping by day, wandering all around in untimely ways. Harmful friends utter stinginess, and these things destroy a person. They play with dice. They drink spirits. They can sort with lovers dear to others, associating with low life and not the esteemed. They come to ruin like the waning moon. The waning moon is the disappearing moon. Okay, the waxing moon is the moon that's getting bigger and fuller, beautiful. Whoever is a drunkard, broke and destitute, dragged by thirst from bar to bar, sinking into debt like a stone in the water, into bewilderment quickly plunges. When sleeping late becomes a habit and night is seen as time to rise up, for one perpetually intoxicated, home life cannot be maintained. Too cold I am, too hot, too late, they say, having wasted work time this way. The young miss out on opportunities. For one regarding cold and hot as not more than blades of grass, doing whatever should be done, happiness will not be a stranger. Young man, you must be aware of these four enemies disguised as friends, the taker, the talker, the flatterer, and the reckless companion. The taker can be identified by four things, by only taking, asking for a lot while giving very little, performing duty out of fear, and offering service in order to gain something personally. The talker can be identified by four things, by reminding of past generosity, promising future generosity, mouthing empty words of kindness, and protesting personal misfortune when called on to help anyone. The flatterer, he can be identified 
by four things, by supporting both bad and good behavior indiscriminately, praising you to your face, putting you down behind your back. The reckless companion can be identified by four things, by accompanying you in drinking, roaming around at night, partying and gambling. That is what the Buddha said. Summing up in verse, the sublime teacher then said, the friend who is all take, the friend of empty words, the friend full of flattery and the reckless friend. These four are not friends, but enemies. The wise understand this and they keep them at a distance as they would a dangerous path. Young man, be aware of these four good hearted friends. Instead, the helper, the friend who endures in good times and bad, the mentor and the compassionate friend, the helper who can be identified by four things, by protecting you when you are vulnerable and likewise your wealth, being a refuge when you are afraid and in various tasks, providing double what is requested of them. The enduring friend can be identified by four things, by telling you secrets, guarding your own secrets closely, not abandoning you in misfortune, and even dying for you. The mentor can be identified by four things, by restraining you from wrongdoing, guiding you towards good actions, telling you what you ought to know and showing you the path to heaven. The compassionate friend can be identified by four things, by not rejoicing at your misfortune, delighting in your good fortune, preventing others from speaking ill of you, encouraging others who praise your good qualities. That is what the Buddha said. And then summing up in verse, the sublime teacher said, the friend who is a helper, the friend through thick and thin, the friend who gives good counsel and the compassionate friend. These four are friends indeed. The wise understand this and attend on them carefully like a mother would attend to her own child. The wise endowed with virtue, they shine forth like a burning fire gathering wealth as bees do honey and heaping it up like an ant hill. Once wealth is accumulated, family and household life may follow. By dividing wealth into four parts, true friendships are bound. One part should be enjoyed, two parts invested in business, and the fourth set aside against future misfortunes. And how, young man, does the noble disciple protect the six directions? These six directions should be known, mother and father as the east, teachers as the south, spouse and family as the West, friends and colleagues as the North, workers and servants in the lower direction, and ascetics and Brahmins as the upper direction. In five ways should a mother and father as the Eastern direction be respected by a child. I will support them who supported me. I will do my duty to them. I will maintain the family lineage and tradition. I will be worthy of my inheritance 
and I will make donations on behalf of dead ancestors. And my mother and father so respected reciprocate means they do something back for them when they respect them. Reciprocate with compassion in five ways by retraining you from wrongdoing, guiding you towards good actions, training you in a profession, supporting the choice of a suitable spouse, and in due time, handing over the inheritance. It's wonderful, you know, we see this happening in India. It, we don't see this in the United States. It doesn't work that way, you know, but we see this in India. In this way, the Eastern direction is protected and made peaceful and secure. Now in five ways should teachers as the Southern direction be respected by a student by rising for them when they come in the room, regularly attending lessons, eagerly desiring to learn duly serving them and receiving instruction. And the teachers so respected reciprocate with compassion in five ways. By training in self-discipline, ensuring the teachings are well grasped, instructing in every branch of knowledge, introducing their friends and colleagues, providing safeguards in every direction. In this way, the Southern direction is protected and made peaceful and secure. The in five ways, should a wife as the Western direction be respected by a husband by honoring, not disrespecting him, being faithful, sharing authority, and by giving gifts. And the wife so respected reciprocates with compassion in five ways, by being well organized, being kindly disposed to the in-laws and household workers, being faithful and looking after the household goods, and being skillful and diligent in all duties. Now you see, I have a title for that when the wife is working like that. And they're called either a domestic engineer or they are called a, um, what's the other one, let's see, domestic engineer or a home executive, home executive or domestic engineer. In the United States, the women during the women's uh, liberation movement, one of the things they did, it was the only thing really that I liked, was they they said women needed equal pay for doing the same work as men. And I stood up for that. The other thing I stood up for was I refused to put down that I was a housewife on my tax returns. I only would say domestic engineer or home executive. And they marched against this housewife thing because it just isn't appreciated the way it should be in our the majority of our system in the United States. So if you're a homemaker and you have three children and I interview you to get a job in my company or something, I would respect you if you worked as a home executive for eight years and managed the purchasing and the nutrition and the counseling and the transportation and all the things you did for four children and your husband. <laughs> I would really respect you. And I would give you a job in my, my company because you were so organized and you would be able to work when your children were older. This is what I used to teach women. So in this way, the Western direction is protected and made peaceful and secure. In five ways should friends and colleagues as the Northern direction be respected by generosity, kind words, acting for their welfare, impartiality and honesty, 
and friends and colleagues so respected reciprocate with compassion in five ways by protecting you when you are vulnerable. And likewise, your wealth is protected, being a refuge when you are afraid, not abandoning you in misfortunes and honoring all your ancestors. In this way, the Northern direction is protected and made peaceful and secure. In five ways, should workers and servants as the lower direction be respected by an employer by allocating work according to their aptitude, providing wages and food, looking after the sick, sharing special treats, and giving reasonable time off for work. And workers and servants so respected reciprocate with compassion in five ways. Being willing to start early and finish late when necessary, taking only what is given, doing the work well and promoting a good reputation. This is order in life. This is the order of life. In this way, the lower direction is protected and made peaceful and secure. Now in five ways, should ascetics and Brahmins as the upper direction be respected by kindly actions, speech and thoughts, having an open door and providing material needs. And ascetics and Brahmins so respected reciprocate with compassion in six ways by retraining you from wrongdoing, guiding you to good actions, thinking compassionately, telling you what you ought to know, clarifying what you already know, and showing you the path to heaven. In this way, the upper direction is protected and made peaceful and secure. Summing up in verse, the sublime teacher then said, mother and father as the east, teachers as the south, spouses and family as the west, friends and colleagues as the north, servants and workers below, Brahmins and ascetics above. These directions a person should honor in order to be truly good, wise and virtuous, gentle and eloquent, humble and accommodating, such a person attains glory, energetic, not lazy, not shaken in misfortune, flawless in conduct and intelligent, such a person attains glory, a compassionate maker of friends, approachable, free from stinginess, a leader, a teacher, a diplomat, such a person attains glory. Generosity and kind words, conduct for others, welfare, impartiality in all things, these are suitable everywhere. These kind dispositions hold the world together like the linchpin of a moving chariot. And should these kind dispositions not exist, then the mother would not receive respect or honor from her child, neither would the father. Upon these things, the wise will reflect. They obtain greatness and are sources of praise. When all was said, the young householder, Sigalak, Sigalika, he exclaimed to the Buddha, wonderful, dear sir, wonderful. It is as though you have set upright what was learned and uncovered what was concealed or shown the path to one gone astray or you brought an oil lamp into the darkness such that those with eyes could see. So too has the Buddha made clear the Dhamma by various ways. I go for the refuge to the Dhamma, the Buddha, and to the Dhamma, and to the monastic community. 
may the exalted one accept me as a lay follower gone for refuge from henceforth for as long as I live. So that's how he set up the Sigilavata Sutta. The Buddha's teaching to me is really fascinating, you know, because he sets this up for the lay people and he sets up an organization of the monastics that's lasted 2,500 years. That to me is amazing. Maybe it's not operating fully in some places, but I have been in places where it's operating completely as it's supposed to, you see? So it's still there after 2,500 years. Uh, we call it, monastics will say it's, um, they'll say, what is it, a democracy? Well, not exactly. It's a benevolent dictatorship. Okay, it's benevolent though, it's kind, it's orderly. One of the places we should go is to look at another example that we can go to um, for, for um, how you're supposed to be getting along. If you go to Upak Kalesa Sutta number 128 in the Majjhima Nikaya, um, the Buddha is visiting um, Anuruddha and uh, Kimberly and uh, the three of them, there's three of them, let's see. Yeah, this is where, I don't wanna see that. I wanna see where they come together. They're visiting, uh, visiting Anuruddha and then Kimberly is the second one. And um, there's a third one, Nambia, I think, Nambia. And the first thing he does when he gets there to visit them, he asks them how they're doing, the three of them living together, you see? And I used to teach this to people who had Boy Scout troops. and <laughs> They were going hiking and they had to go on a long hike. And they were like 30 people that had to get along on this hike. And I would read this to them. And um, when you hear him talk, he's basically starting with Anuruddha. Um, he says, Anuruddha, I hope you are comfortable. This is in section 10. It's on page uh, 1011. It's the 128. It's on page 1011. And it's section 11 that I'm reading from just above that. He says, I hope you are all keeping well, Anuruddha. I hope you are comfortable. I hope you are not having any trouble getting alms food. That's the first thing you ask him about, you know, you let you check how he's living. And we are all keeping well, blessed one, we are comfortable, we are not having any trouble getting alms food, you see. I hope Anuruddha that you are all living in concord with mutual appreciation, without disputing, blending like milk and water, viewing each other with kindly eyes. Now, when I read this to the Boy Scouts, I, I make sure there's uh, two cups of water there in a glass, two glasses of water. In their first glass, I pour oil and I put coloring in it. So green oil, I put it in that floats to the top of the water, you see. And so everything doesn't blend together in the glass. This is what he's talking about. You can do this with your kids. It's kind of fun. We don't get along in the house. So you have an oil and water house. <laughs> But if you're getting along in your house, you pour a little bit of milk into the water and you're blending like milk and water, viewing each other with kindly eyes is the expression. You're all getting along in the household. You know, during COVID, a lot of people have come back home and we have uh, lots of people who didn't think they were going to end up being in the house with mom and dad or the aunts and uncles are going to be in the same place. And some families that brought their whole families into one whole household just to make it so we're all together to go through this thing, you see. And it's not easy. They've been in two or three families functioning. The children aren't together all the time. There's all kinds of things going on. So what I do is spend time teaching them about Anicca. 
you know, whatever is going on, it's only going on for a little while because whatever arises passes away. Do you understand it, Nietzsche? And they'll say, well, yes. Okay, well, what does it mean? It's impermanent. Okay, so whatever he's doing to you, stop it. Just go away and in 25 minutes, it's all going to change. Everything changes. It keeps changing and changing. Okay, I'll go get a book. <laughs> or something they'll go play the piano or something for a little while then come back we have to start using what he's teaching is the point there's so much uh, i was reading a description of the majima nikaya my students should listen very carefully and it said the majima nikaya is just a book with a bunch of discussions in it between people that's what it said when they say things like that, I want to take a, a few days off and write letters to the people who wrote this and say, don't you understand what was in the Majima Nikaya? It was a method of teaching. You see, it's not just a bunch of discussions. These monks uh, were, when you listen to the organizations of their day and how they lived and what they did from the time they get up, uh, and have their breakfast and clean up and then they go out to sit for the day and then they're they, they go out in the very morning they go out at, at five it's about five o'clock in the morning as soon as you can see your hand like this in front of me then it's time for me to start walking to go on alms round I did this for three months when I was in Sri Lanka a young nun taught me how to go on alms round in in a rural area so we had to go about not real far, about two miles or three, two or three kilometers, you know? The men, they're crazy. <laughs> they go nine, nine or 10 kilometers and they go, when there's 11 or 12 monks, they've got to get enough for everybody. So they're going to a whole number of houses, but it's a very, very heartfelt thing to live on alms. When you go to a house, the question here with alms, let me take you a lesson on this for a minute, is, is a person who is living on alms, who is a monastic, are they a beggar or are they making you a king? This is the question. So what do, what do I mean by that? Well, if you look up the definition for a beggar, in some dictionaries, it's just awful. <laughs> a beggar is someone who has nothing to give human beings, other to give people at all, nothing to give them. And they're going to live begging to get food enough to survive. They have nothing to give back. There's no, no reciprocity, no reciprocal arrangement there at all. Okay. That's terrible. <laughs> That's not what this is about at all. But when we go on alms, we do not knock on your door and say, hello, Kushal, I'm here to get alms. We don't do that, <laughs> okay? We don't do that. We're just walking by the gate. Why do they have orange robes? Why, why did they have orange robes? Is because then you can see them out the corner of your eye. They're going by your gate and you'll see them in the cities like this, you know? And and we, we just pause as we go by the gates, we don't stop. But if they, we hear somebody coming out of the house immediately to give something into the bowl, we will wait. Now, one time someone said, how can you do that? Those people are very poor. I said, but you don't understand what this really is, I explained to him. When I stop and I turn with my head down and the whole time I am walking in alms, I am, sending loving kindness to the people and to the whole area and to the animals to the people to everything when we're walking that's all we're doing when we stop and you come out we just hold our bowl our lid off our bowl and you put whatever you wish to put in and one morning i told the story in chicago one morning some woman came out and she took a potato chip it was one potato chip and she took it like this and she went like this and she bowed her head and she put one potato chip in my bowl. And it was the way she did it. It was all she had to give from that breakfast in that house. It was in the middle of nowhere. They were very poor, one potato chip. Well, this woman who heard this story in Chicago, she said, that's terrible. She should give you the best food she had in her house. I said, 
you, you don't have any idea where I was. I was in Horina in Sri Lanka, and it's a very, very poor area. It's the way she gave me that potato chip was so incredibly meaningful. And what I did for her was I gave her the opportunity to give me food, a piece of food, so that I could have food for the day at school, my morning breakfast and my, my lunch, you see? And I gave her the opportunity to give the way a king would give, and that's called kingly giving. If you're, you know, if a king ever gives you some, he doesn't expect anything back. So when you give something to someone and nothing is expected back at all, you see, that's a kingly gift. And she gave me that potato chip and I almost had tears in my eyes when I watched her. And then she gave another potato chip to the other nun who was the same way as I was. And we took, and then we, we bowed and gave her a blessing and we put our lids on our bowls and we walked away. Now that's not a beggar. You see, now she can come to the monastery. She can get advice. We can give her the Sigalav, Sigalik, oh gosh, Sigalava, I can't do it. <laughs> Sig, Sigalaka Sutta or Sigalavado Sutta, okay? To teach them how to put their lives together and have it work for them in India. Or we can counsel them and talk to them if someone died. We can teach them how to live with grief so that it doesn't overwhelm them. We can teach them how grief actually works and why you get too far into grief and it causes an imbalance and too much pain and you can't even, you can't get out of bed. You're just exhausted, you know. Um, grief, there's two kinds of pain. You have sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. And when you read the description of that, grief is the mental pain. That's what grief is in that line that we say, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. A lot of tears and a lot of maybe anger and stuff. But then the pain is physical pain developed from too much grief and exhaustion and dehydration. This is not a place to fool around with dehydration. You have to be very careful. And understanding that grief is like any other pain in your body is a very important thing to learn. When someone has cancer of the bone and they have, uh, you know, I can explain to you this way, the, the pain is coming from in the bone marrow and the bone and it it has a cycle and if you're in a care center if you watch the cycle of the pain you discover oh it always comes up and then travels and then it gets there and it gets very sore and then it fades and you begin to see this is a cycle i taught children who were cancer patients in Texas in a hospital, a military hospital in um, Houston and then in another city down there and San Antonio, okay? And then in Houston. And in both cases, the kids were amazing. They could learn this so easily. And so that gives them something to watch. So what can they watch? How does it make a difference when you are sick and you have pain if you understand how something works, you are not afraid of it anymore. That's the big one, isn't it? The anxiety of what's going to happen next and fear when maybe you don't need to have that fear so much if you understood what was really happening in your body. So you can teach a person with really heavy arthritis, the serious kind of the rheumatoid arthritis, where the hands are all gnarled and they can't use their hands at all. And a lot of the pain, the, a lot of the loss of movement is from the fear of losing the hand completely. But if you teach them when they start to do this each evening, then you can exercise it lightly and there's certain ways with heat or cold to help it. Then they start paying attention because they know it 
it is always going to arise, it will be there and pass away. So Anicca, even though we say to you, Anicca is everything is changing and that's gonna cause you suffering at the same time. If you understand what everything is changing all the time, then you will never again believe that you are stuck. You are not stuck because everything is going to change. You see, you are not stuck. So that's a lesson on Nietzsche. It turns out to be your friend because it's going to arise and be there and pass away. That's how everything in the universe works, you see? So this thing about uh, what can we learn from the Anicca Dukkha Anatta? Now, the pain came up. Now, let's talk about Anatta for a minute. Anatta, I'm sorry. Sorry, all you guys. <laughs> anatta. If you have Atta, then what's happening here is you are very, very concerned about that pain. And when you get very concerned about it, it hurts very much more. Now, why is that happening? Because if you go into the Samyutta Nikaya, it's on page 1597 or something, 95 or 1597, you're going to find there is a discussion in there about um, hindrances and the, it's called the nourishment and the denourishment, giving it food or not giving food to a hindrance in relationship to the arising or the non-arising, it's going to come up or it's not going to come up, the seven enlightenment factors. Now, why are they so important? Well, if you're interested in going to go down the path, reach the path and go down the path to experience all the way to Nibbana, you can't get to cessation unless the seven enlightenment factors are perfectly uh, balanced like, like this, four plus seven, they're just balanced. You cannot have these guys going like that. You see, you can't have them like that. It's like a computer game. They have to go click like that and then you fall into cessation when that's what happens down there. And we know this, you know, from wiring people up and from watching all these students, hundreds and hundreds of students, and what happens to them when they're in the deeper levels? What is happening as they want to get to the place where they can fall over into cessation, turning off, turning off what? Feeling, perception, and consciousness for briefly, very briefly, for seconds. And when it turns back on again, Dependent origination comes back on, those 12 links go do 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 do. And when they turn, when they get to the 12th one, it, your mind goes like that, opens. Ooh, what happens when it opens? Clear. It's like by the time you get to that place, Atta is gone, <laughs> you know? Because in order to get there, you cannot pay any attention to anything, just watch. This is why I was trying to explain to you when I was teaching the practice to you, you just watch in order to see what happens next. You don't do anything. If you try to do anything, you can't do it. If you want, like uh, someone wrote me and said, what's wrong here? I felt very light today, yesterday, and I want this to happen again today. And I can just smile because if you want it, this is a rule. If you want it, personally want it to happen again, you can't have it. It won't happen again. Everything is as it is based on the conditions that arise and are there. And so our job in order to get to path and then on, with path knowledge, uh, you know, enough knowledge of the Dhamma and reach the path is to step back and let go, 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 let go. You understand? That's 
where you're going. And for a lot of people today in the world, not just in America, and not just in the West, it's here too. Everybody's competing. Everybody wants to get to the top first. Everybody has to do it first. Everybody wants to say, I did it. That's why there aren't a lot of attainments around. Because if you're trying to get there, you can't get there. And if they never tell you that part of the lesson, you're going to keep trying and trying and trying and trying. I have talked to people who did it for 25 years and said, I'm just quitting. And I said, before you quit, could you sit down and not do anything and just be on a cushion and just watch? Well, maybe. How about if I said you have to smile and have fun when you do it? That's ridiculous. Nobody has fun when they're meditating. And I said, who, why do you think that they called the monks the happy ones? Because they were happy. I mean, when you listen to the, the description of them in Sutta number 89, they are, where is it? It's like, when you hear that statement, you understand why did King Pasanadi give those monks that, that, um, that pleasure garden so that they could be there. And King Pasanadi said to the Buddha, I saw all these other sloppy monastics in this pleasure garden and nobody, I wouldn't want anybody to see them. Their robes were dirty, their robes were, you know, uh, you know, ripped and like rags and they were looking grouchy like this and they had problems and all that stuff. I don't want people to come see them. But then he said, but here I see your bhikkhus, uh-oh, smiling and cheerful, sincerely joyful, plainly delighting with their faculties fresh, living at ease, unruffled, subsisting on what others give them and abiding with a mind that is aloof. A mind that is aloof isn't trying to do anything. It's just watching the present time, walking around. And that's how a deer behaves, aloof as a wild deer's mind. And I have thought, surely these venerable ones perceive successful states of lofty distinction in the blessed one's dispensation, since they abide with smiling and cheerful minds. And they are sincerely joyful and delighting in such a way and their faculties are fresh, their faces are bright. And who wouldn't want to go and sit with them? Why wouldn't I want the people in this town to go and see them sitting there? And so he let them use that for rains retreat for 17 years or something like that. It was a long time that those monks went there. So when these Anuruddha, when he was visiting Anuruddha, when we get back to them, first he asked them if they're comfortable and he wants to know if they're blending like milk and water and viewing each other with kindly eyes. And then what happens is they say, we are living in accord with mutual appreciation without disputing and blending like what milk and water, viewing each other with kindly eyes. But Anuruddha, how do you live like this? And then that he explains to the Buddha, sir, as to that, I think thus, it is a gain for me, it is a great gain for me that I am living with such companions in this holy life. I maintain bodily acts of loving kindness towards these venerable ones, both openly and privately in my mind. I maintain verbal acts of loving kindness towards them both openly and privately and mental acts of loving kindness toward both of them openly and privately. Why should I not set aside what I wish to do and do what these venerable ones wish to do? Then I set aside what I wish to do and I do what the venerable ones wish to do we are different in body, venerable sir, but, but we are one in mind. The three of them are bound for Nibbana. The three of them are working through their attainments together. They're, they're, they're helping each other. They're discussing their meditation with each other. 
and talking, uh, this happened to me in the first genre, this happened to me in the second genre, what happened to you? Oh, that happened to me too. And you think, wow, that happened to you too. It happened to me. What happened in the third genre? Uh, this is what happened to me. And the third one comes and says, you know, that happened to me. Now, when that happens, at that point, you know something's going on here because it's happening through these three people are having the same thing experienced in those levels as they pass through. Isn't that something? And that's what we have going on with what I'm trying to teach you. In retreats, that's what's happening. You see, the, the, the people are going through the descriptions of the practice as it precisely described in the text and experiencing it the way Sariputta was practicing it. And it's actually an awareness. It's not going into a deep concentration because I told you when I was teaching you, this is, this concentration is a productive concentration. It's declared a productive concentration. We say collectedness of mind, a gentle collectedness of mind, not tight like that. So you can't see anything inside and you're concentrating on something and not too loose so that you don't have any place to come back to, but like this. And that's the story of Soma. I didn't tell you the story of Soma. I don't think, I can't remember if I did or not. But Soma was a monk who was having trouble getting to Nibbana and the monks were concerned about it. The monks that lived with him because his feet were bleeding and he wasn't taking care of them. At that point, he's think, they're thinking we have to get the Buddha to come and talk to him because he could die from this if he gets an infection, very serious. And they, have, they had whole suttas and everything about taking care of each other. And this was a big concern. They went and brought the, brought the Buddha to see Soma. And then at that point, he decided, listening to Soma talk, listen, Soma, tell me something. What did you do before you were a monk? And Soma said, I, I played a lute. You, you were a lute player. Soma, how do you tune a lute? And Soma decides to tell him how to tune a lute. And he says, you know, there's a bridge and you have to pull the string over the bridge and then down and you can't make it too tight because if you make it too tight, then the sound of the string will squeak like, <laughs> you see? But if you make it too loose, then it will sound like even the deep ones sound that way. You have to do it just right, not too tight and not too loose. And he said, that's the problem, Soma. You are too tight, but you can't be too loose. But you have to get in the middle and you have to develop so you can see inside exactly the way Sariputta was able to describe what happened in each one of the jhanas. Those are the things that we can actually learn to see, but we can't be too tight. If we're too tight, we can never see those. So if someone says that that sutta, number 111, the Anu, uh, Anupada Sutta is not a good sutta, you say to them, well, how do you practice? I practice like this. Well, then of course, the sutta doesn't mean anything to them. And no matter how hard they try, they would never be able to see what Sariputta saw because they're too tight. And then if you said it to another person, they said, oh, well, I tried that and it's no good at all. Well, how do you practice? I don't use an object of meditation. So when they're without any object of meditation, they can't see. But Sariputta found a way to watch inside. He found an aware jhana, it's a third kind of meditation. And there have been some theses now written about it in Thai universities by Mark Edsel Johnson. There has been another book by David Johnson, one of our people at Damasuka, taking you step by step through this whole thing to understand that there are three kinds. There is the kind with an object, the kind with no object. And then there was a kind of practice the Buddha found, which was that we think he found. And that one 
is a samatha and vipassana working together with an awareness so you can watch the development happening in your mind and that one you can make progress with really neat so i'm going far enough with this but you get the idea of these monks living together and how they talk about how they are living together and the sigalavada sutta took you through all the different symbols and directions explaining how the buddha paid attention to all of it in design of the orderliness of living so do you have any questions anybody questions time for questions I, I have a question, Sister uh, Kema. Sure. This is uh, regarding the uh, one of the direct six directions. You know, they are saying that uh, uh, the uh, ascetics and uh, 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 gods are in the uh, upper direction, which is uh, uh, above. Uh, above, yeah. yeah, yeah, and that refers to heaven. But is uh, is heaven uh, considered? Uh, at all in Buddhism, or is it just a hypothetical? <laughs> no, I don't no, think I don't think that. we've ever done this with you. But um, uh, let's see. I don't know where my chart is. Uh, when when you get, you know, I should really torture you. I should say, go to the United States and spend time with David because he loves this. You know, and see, the chart goes like this. It goes way, 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 way up here, and they make it all. And I always think the charts are a little bit funny, you know, because when you go into 107 in section two, the Ganika Sutta, okay, um, they're talking and the Buddha is saying, I teach a practice, uh, I teach a, um, uh, I teach this practice and it's and i teach you the information and then you practice and then you make progress you know but it's a it's a gradual teaching a gradual practice and gradual progress down to the last step of the staircase now see that's the way it feels isn't it you're getting calmer and calmer you're going deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper but all the charts that they're making buddhists are going like this this is kind of the world <laughs> it's all going up like this and there's the different heavens to see to heaven and um gamma gavesi which are the different heavens i can't remember the Tisita and there are kind of uh, the heavens of uh, the earth, like uh, the uh, heavens which are there, uh, they're called tree gods. Then uh, there is a heaven of the 33. Heaven of the 33. Many, is I, I, yeah, I, right. I, there's, but there's like four he basic ones. The, but the charts and everything. Yeah, he it's says, like Dave uh, realm and then heaven of the 33, and then there's this one, and then there's a top one, and then there might be five. You don't think about these things. Don't get lost. <laughs> you know, it's like when people start, the Buddha um, had all the, the chart over here uh, of David. Yeah. yeah, if you really, if you really, he'll send you, he'll send you wads of stuff on this. He has, he collects it. The one, the part he really likes is about hell. He likes the hells. And when, I, when we were in uh, Malaysia, we went to the mountain place, this place, this huge place, and it's a Chinese Mahayana, okay? So outside, it was like Disney World, where you took the carriage and you went through and pushed the child through to see the, the nine hills. There are nine different hills you can end up in. And I, thought, I, I took a walk and I went through and I said, I can't believe that people would take their children and push them in the cart to see all these hills. <laughs> really, you know, telling each one, you can get caught, you can get caught in the animal well realm, if you think it would be nice to be a hawk, do not think like that. If you end up being a bird, I want you to watch a bird for a day. And tell me if that's a relaxing life. Watch closely. Their metabolism is wads faster than ours, lots and lots. And their, their heads like this, you know, their heads like, they're waiting for the hawk to come down, steal their eggs and kill them and take their babies. That's their whole entire life. They do have a, a, a family structure. Uh, if a 
mother bird loses a baby because a snake came and killed one of them one time and he didn't eat it it fell and so the father pulled it over and the mother wouldn't leave and the father's standing there saying look we got to go now. We got to build another nest and lay some more eggs. Come on, we got to go. But she was just mourning and she stayed around there. I was in my bed in a tiny cootie looking out the window and watched this whole drama unfold. She would not leave and he was in the tree and she was on the ground walking around the baby's body and she was not going to go. Just like the story of the mother who came, whose baby died and she would not let go of it. And she went to the Buddha and she said to him, listen, you're the Buddha. It's like going to Jesus. You're Jesus. You can save this baby, bring it back to life. Why won't you do that for me? He had an awful lot of compassion for her. And he said, okay, this is what you need to do. Go into the city and find a mustard seed and bring it back to me but you have to find it in a house where no one has ever died in that family. That's what he did. And she walked around all day with that baby, with that body, trying to find the mustard seed. And she came back and said, it wasn't there. It wasn't there. By then she had calmed down. He said, you need to take the baby. You need to bury the baby, take it to the forest and bury the baby. And she did. But he wasn't going to scold her. He wasn't going to abruptly say anything to her. He sent her on a, a journey. And what, what is the lesson that she learned? And this one woman in Chicago said to me, that's the cruelest thing I ever saw anybody do. And I said, that's because you don't understand the lesson. He had her spend that whole entire day of her life learning the truth of Anicca, you see, Anicca everything is impermanent. We cannot stop this cycle of this impermanence, you see? So the, the whole structure of the heavens is based on karma, okay? And this is a big subject. And the Buddha's position on this, if you were working in earnest towards Nibbana was don't sit and talk about it because there's no solution to it. You can go, there are suttas that explain everything about it. But if you spend a lot of time, it was like getting the answer of what came first, the chicken or the egg, you know, and wanting that when you're 15 years old, sitting up all night long with a group of people trying to figure out what came first. And then you come to this place, well, something, you know, if you're a chemist, you're dying with this thing. If you, something came from nothing <laughs> and, you're stuck, and then everybody goes, we got to go to sleep. You know, it's like three o'clock in the morning and you're trying to figure out what happened here. How come this is, everything is here, everything. That gets interesting because now it goes even further to say that possibly, just possibly, we're creating all of this and it isn't, it isn't really here. I don't want to keep you up all night, but, <laughs> but that's something to, to dwell on, the idea that the entire project is a hologram and we're in it and we don't know when it's going to be when the program the computer program is going to be finished or or is it going to loop around and go again my tendency is to say well all you have to do is start looking at the archaeology that they don't want you to look at and when you start doing that you figure out this has been going around for not thousands of years but millions of years just going around and around in the in the universe but also remember this, if you're gonna go in that direction. The universe, you have uh, the, these four positions of the universe in time where you have the universe is like um, a tiny ball. I don't have one here, but it's like very small or even smaller than this. Say this was, a, this was like a tiny ball. And it's even smaller than this when they explain it to you. And then uh, in science is catching up with Buddhism and they've decided this part is real. This is what's happening in the universe. So this, this is the beginning and this explodes 
and then it goes outwards like this. And when it's expanding out to wherever it's the end point is, where it stops, that's where life exists. So we're in the midst of an expansion. That's where life really exists. Okay, when it gets out there and it stops, life all across the universe stops and it rests for an equal amount of time that it expanded from the explosion, okay? Then when it decides to come back and contract back again to that whole tiny little thing again, that's an equal amount of time. And the resting point here is an equal amount of time. So when you look at these heavens and you look at what it means when you get to the first jhana or the second jhana, how many thousands of years you would be in one of these heavens before you were before there's another life that happens, it just blows your mind, you know, because they're talking, if that's an us, that whole thing is an asa and kaya. And one of these is called, this is a kalpa, this is a kalpa, that's a kalpa, and this is a kalpa, see? So there's four kalpas and an asa and kaya is the whole thing happens. To me, it's just, somebody who's breathing and we're living inside their lungs and it's just a breath and a residue, you see. So we can go with the huge size of the universe and look at all kinds of possibilities are there. Nobody really knows. But the heavens, the Deva heavens are one thing and then the next, uh, the heavens of 33 that, why, how do you end up in these places is, by doing good in this life and you're working through as much of the path as you can. Each one of the jhanas is an attainment who has a number of years. I'll try to find the chart for you. Okay, Bharat, I will. I have one in the closet, but, um, and I have a picture of it. I think I might have a picture of it. Have I can you send it you. The, the PDF uh, presentation of David on this Ooh. chat also, and also on the WhatsApp. Okay, it's let him look at that. Very yeah. Hell that, and, it's uh, fun to sit down and look at it a few times, but don't get addicted. <laughs> you know? plus pages. So, anybody else have a question? One more, more question has been written. Uh, I, yes. I'll just read it. I don't uh, know how uh, he, he meant it. Is metta meditation a samatha or a bhavana? Is it a samatha meditation or a bhavana meditation? If it is a samatha, can we practice vipassana after metta meditation? And how it no, no, uh, no, no. All right, let me try to explain. The end of the session. Um, okay. Once upon a time, <laughs> once upon a time, a long time ago, across the universe, <laughs> this is like Star Wars, <laughs> okay? Um, there, the Buddha, there are different ways of looking at all this whole thing, but in the, in the text, there is um, what we tracked, you're, what you're talking about is the verification, you're asking about the verification of the tranquil wisdom insight meditation. And you're asking, how can you say that this is possibly something that was going on? That's your first question. Second one is, um, we're living in a time when Samatha and Vipassana are two different things, okay? But it wasn't always like that. So if I take you into the text to 149, um, you, at this, uh, in this sutta, you will see there was a, a remark made that's very important. <laughs> okay, when the Buddha is teaching the view of a person such as this is right, okay, his, when a person has right view, his intention is right intention, his effort is right effort, his mindfulness is right mindfulness, his concentration is right concentration, which we know is a productive level of concentration, not too tight, not too loose. But his bodily action, his verbal action, and his livelihood has already been well purified earlier. That's, you cannot take the um, part of, you cannot break the eightfold path up. This is what's happened in modern times. You have eight folds, and when they say something has eight folds, it has eight folds. And what I mean is, if I take this piece of paper and I tell you, okay, um, I can make this eight folds. So we turn this into eight folds just very quickly. And 
we say it's an eightfold path, okay? So when you are learning the Buddha's teaching, it's an easy way to understand, you're getting cooler and cooler and cooler. Now this is eightfold. So when I open it up, now I have to turn it into a fan. So I have to fold it back and forth for a minute here like that, okay? And when I have these eight folds, this is what I do in Sunday school. I taught them this way, okay? Now we have the possibility in the heat of Mumbai <laughs> to actually have a fan. You see, this is wide enough that I can actually fan myself and feel air. Now, you need that air here. <laughs> So if I took three of these away and I said these three, the first three are just for my, just for me um, to, um, how do we say this? They're just for me. The first three are just about my, what did they call that? What did they call that? Um, they called it um, livelihood as well. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. Um, his livelihood has already been well purified earlier. They're thinking about these three, we can just leave them behind. Now we're gonna practice meditation, okay? Well, it doesn't work. Why isn't it working? Why aren't attainments happening? Well, it's because you're playing with a half a deck or less. Now you're trying to get cool, but you only have this much of a fan. You took three pieces off of it and you can only cool yourself. You can't cool yourself with five pieces. You have to have eight pieces. One of the things we learned about the eightfold path, when you say something has is eight folds, constructed with eight folds, you can't take it apart. So you can't take that apart. So in this, they're, they're gonna describe what it is you have to learn, the Dhamma comprehension that has to be learned parallel to learning the meditation. So listen, he says, when he develops the eightfold, wait, I'm sorry, this is the eightfold path comes to fulfillment in him by development. When he develops his noble eightfold path, four foundations of mindfulness also come to fulfillment in him by development, the four right kinds of striving. Now remember, right effort, you think about the four steps of right effort to make it happen. Right striving means four steps of right effort are happening automatically for you now. So if any hindrance comes up, your mind just says, never mind. And it goes, let, let go, relax, smile, come back automatically. Also, that comes to fulfillment in him. The four bases of spiritual power, the five faculties, the five powers, the seven enlightenment factors come to fulfillment in him by development. Now, listen carefully. These two things, serenity and insight, occur in him. Oh, evenly yoked evenly together. What does that mean? Now, if you lived on a farm, you're in good shape because you saw the bulls around here pulling carts or you saw a pair of team of horses pulling a wagon. And when they pull, they have to pull together at the same time. And Rice Davies looked at the word samadhi is part of in part of the trying to verify this whole thing. We saw Rice Davies dictionary. He made a dictionary and he was a the, the guy for Polly and explaining everything. And he said in his dictionary, when you look up Polly, there's a note and you go to the note and he says he is suspicious, very suspicious. Samadhi as a word, it never came up anywhere before the Buddha. When the Buddha comes, Samadhi shows up. Ikagata was there and Ikagata met, was used for talking about uh, concentration. But then Samadhi shows up and initially he believes that this is what the Buddha named his practice. And his practice was like this, yoked together, Samatha and Vipassana, a practice that has works evenly yoked together. So what does that mean? How can you be doing samatha and experience insights? If you get the 16 insights that are involved in Vipassana practice for or Mahasi's 16 insights, and you look at them in the text itself, I think there were only uh, nine, six or nine, I can't remember. And Mahasi noticed 
Then Rula Mahasi noticed when you interview people, these things, some of them break into three little pieces. So he ends up making 16 in, uh, insights to have you discover 16 insights to complete yourself to become Sotapanna. That's a track for Mahasi Center, the way they do it. Okay, now the thing is, these insights, Bonte came upstairs one time when we were on the mountain and there were six of us there, the original six that were working on the mountain with him and clearing the land. And he says, at breakfast, I have an announcement to make. And we said, what? And he said, I am a Vipassana teacher. And we all sat there and laughed and we said, no, you're not. You teach us metta and it's like, it's like samatha. It's not vipassana. And he said, well, let me ask you a question. Have you had any insights since you've been doing this metta bhavana, this, this Brahma Vihara practice? And we said, what do you mean? And he started asking us the insights they make in the other practice. And we realized we understood all of it. We had experienced all of it. We understood it completely. So you do have insights that occur in the tranquil wisdom insight meditation, but they're occurring like this. You're, you're working in Samatha and then you discover a Nietzsche and it goes, oh, that's a Nietzsche. Ooh, and you're back in your Samatha. And then you're going through the jhanas and you go, oh, look at that. That's dependent origination. Aha, uh aha, -huh, aha. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And then all of a sudden you say, look, there's anatta. That's the difference between atta and anatta. And how we were training was very special. I was thinking about this earlier tonight. Um, suppose you were going to go to school and you were going to study Shakespeare. And you, but you didn't like it and you quit the course because you didn't want to say all that funny language the way they were talking. You know, you didn't want to do it. And you knew it was going to take you a long time to understand what are they talking about if they're talking that way when they're doing these plays. So you quit the course. Well, see, what we're doing is not easy, but it's so much fun that we want to stick with it because of the results are so incredibly good. Okay. And the thing is, you quit the course for the Shakespeare because you didn't want to take the time to learn it. What were we doing, the six of us on that mountain originally? He was teaching us to work all day, doing building and cleaning up the property and cleaning up trees, chopping wood and clearing land for building the buildings and all that. And we had to sit twice or three times a day if we could in between when we're working in the forest and then we would come back take showers and then we would go and to a dhamma talk and he would give us a two-hour dhamma talk every night but he was experimenting the same time we were learning from him he was experimenting to see can these dumb americans these westerners can they be disciplined enough to come and learn like the monks actually learned where they listened every night to the dhamma being given and I've done some funny things. They, they say the Buddha taught 84,000 suttas and the Arahats taught the other um, 84, 2,000, okay? So I figured out how many hours there were in the life of the Buddha from the time that he was enlightened until he died. How many hours were there? And then I took, and it was winter time. I just needed something to do. And I found out all the places he went in India and the distances and how long I thought it must have taken him to get there, how many days. And I figured everything out. When I did the whole thing, he actually could have given 84,000 suttas and he probably had about 119, uh, I think it's 100 and I can't remember, 19,000 or 190,000 hours left in there to be sick and have things happen and whatever else happened. There was leftover time. I broke it all down into days and spaces and distances and hours. And I came to Bonte. I said, he really did give 84,000 suttas. Now, the reason I'm saying this to you all is don't get hooked on the idea if you understand the Satipatthana Sutta, that's the only direct way to Nibbana and it's all you ever have to know. See, the problem is here, when he gave the Satipatthana Sutta, 
the monks who were listening, they had a lot of other information from a lot of those other talks at the time that Sutta is given. And they had a lot of pieces of information that came together in that Satipatthana Sutta. And tranquil wisdom insight meditation is practicing this samadhi, meaning tranquil, sama is the basis samatha, right? And D is attached to the word wisdom. And if you break those words up, Rice Davies said, that's tranquil wisdom. That's where the name of tranquil wisdom insight meditation comes from. In the text, this isn't the only place, this one sutta I read you, that implies that these used to be together. And when I spoke to some very old teachers, I mean, in their 90s in Sri Lanka, yeah, they knew about it, but it wasn't, it was before their lifetime. There's, we're not going to spend time trying to figure out when these two fell apart. But I want you to think about the situation between Samatha and Vipassana. Samatha, it's like, my dog's bigger than your dog. <laughs> Let's see what your dog's like. You know, it's like everybody's fighting all over the world. Samatha is the way, Vipassana is the way. Samatha is the way, Vipassana is the way. You see, the thing is the Vipassana discoveries are happening with the Samatha the way the Buddha did it. That's what happened. We're, we, we're pretty sure that's what happened. And the reason we think that's what happened is because of how fast the people are learning this. You people, if you're here from the workshop, I talked to Bhante about this the next day. I told him we didn't expect you to get to the other people. We just thought we were going to give a few lectures and we didn't think you were going to progress in only three days or four days time like that. Because we always say five days to taste it, five whole days of practicing to taste this. So how come you did? Let's talk about that for just a second. Because I got very excited about what I learned from your workshop. I, I haven't talked to um, madam yet about this, you know, Yoshna about it. But the thing is, I had a theory because of my charts that go back 15 years for all the retreats he teaches. I keep charts of what everybody's doing. I had a theory that Vipassana practitioners are ahead of the game to come and learn this. And it works very fast. Why? Why? Because you all, if you were practicing Vipassana, are paying attention to learning to detect cessation, I'm, I'm sorry, sensations in your body. That's why. And your sensitivity is highly developed to what happens right here in your head, to what tickles your ear, to what's going on if you feel anything anywhere in your body. I've watched people for years. So what is the cause of suffering? We say craving. And you say to me, what is craving? Craving always manifests. That means it comes up first with a change in what? A change in the tension and tightness level in your body, in your mind. The Buddha was practicing something totally in reference to the mind. And you know what? Guess what? The mind is part of the body. Now that sounds funny for me to say that, but in America, we went through a period of time in exercise classes where we thought everything came from here down. <laughs> and, and we didn't, that was in the 60s and 70s, and we didn't include the mind here, you know? And uh, what does the Dhammapada tell you about what's going on in your body with states? And states include sensations that occur. What does the Dhammapada say for the first verse? Mind is the forerunner of all states. Mind made are they. Doesn't matter if they're this way or that way. Doesn't matter. They all start here. So I envision this as the control center of your whole entire body with two little people inside there looking out my eyes and watching everything that is happening in my life. <laughs> and it all starts in your mind. So the Buddha finally gets it. He gets it and he stops the uh, Vipassana and the yogi stuff he was doing before, before he goes 
to the tree and under the tree to go through, we have what happened to him, the memory that he had in Sutta number 36. That's important. He remembered a time in 36, I can't read it to you, it's, it's right, it's at 3630. And you go there and you look at that and piece this together. What happened to him? After he's discussing about five or seven pages here about all the things he tried to get to Nibbana and they didn't work. And he's telling the monks, don't hold your breath. Don't use breathing. Don't, um, don't try to hold your breath. Don't starve yourself. Don't do this. Don't do that. And he keeps telling him, I did this, 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 and this, and it didn't work. I did this, 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 and it didn't work. It gives, the whole sutta is like that. Then he comes to 30 and he says, I thought whatever recluses and Brahmins in the past have experienced painful, racking, piercing feelings like I did due to exertion. This is the utmost, there is none beyond this, what I've been through. And whatever recluses and Brahmins in the future experience painful, racking, piercing feelings due to exertion, this is the utmost, there is none beyond it. And then he keeps talking about that. But by this racking practice, by this racking practice of austerities, I have done, I have not attained any superhuman states or any distinction in knowledge and vision that is worthy of noble ones. He knows it. He hasn't. Could there be another path to enlightenment, he asks himself. And I considered, he thought, he, this memory came up. I considered, I recall that when my father, the Sakyan, was occupied, he means in the plowing ceremony in the story of the Buddha, while I was sitting in the cool shade of the rose apple tree, and we have a hunch that the nurse left him sitting under the rose apple tree because she wanted to be part of the ceremony with the plowing ceremony. I was quite secluded from sensual pleasures. What does it mean? quite secluded in that spot from having being interested in seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, or touching. That's what that means. I was quite secluded from whole sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states. I entered upon and abided in the first jhana, which is accompanied by thinking and examining thought with joy and happiness born of seclusion. Could that be the way to the path of the enlightenment? Then following on that memory came the realization to him very clearly, this is indeed the path to enlightenment. From that point on, Rice Davies is with us on this, you know, he changes his approach to his practice. And at that point, he manages to go through. And we have the account of Sariputta's experience in the Anupada Sutta, the 111, describing how he was practicing. And when you examine that, he was not concentrating and he wasn't in concentration jhanas. He was fully aware if we go if you want, if you guys come back, we can teach the Anupada one night and look at each piece of what happens in each of the levels as you go through the one, two, three, four jhanas and infinite space, infinite consciousness, nothingness, and neither perception or non-perception. What is happening or not happening? And when you begin to understand what's happening, the Buddha is praising him simply because that he is giving you the best account he could. And we wondered, is that practice still possible? And that practice is possible, but it's happening in a joined way with the Samatha and the Vipassana happening. And you're watching inside, you have these insights. You ha also have insights, of course, when you're walking, when you're walking and meditating, you know, doing walking meditation, insights happen. And but it's not all body-based. He decided to go to what? He decided to go 
to the control center. Yeah, he's going to look at the control center. What better place to go if all things start in the mind? Then let's go to the control center and watch what happens here first before anything else. So when we're discussing dependent origination, explaining that to you, that's where you begin to see he was really able to see these things and you can see them too. And that's when we got really hooked on all of this. We started thinking, this is incredible. We can see these levels and watch what happens and go through them. It's quite amazing. And everything was true. And then you find out how it's working. So the point is Vipassana, Samatha Vipassana, it wasn't hooked, uh, divided. It was hooked together. It was two components, like the two horses or the two, the two, um, the two bulls trying to pull the wagon. And if one is too strong, it's going to make the wagon turn, and it won't go through the gate. If the other one is too strong, you can't get in the city gate. They have to be able to pull together, and then they have to be able to let you see things, help you see things as you're going along. You see what's happening? So it's very different. It's, it's different in that respect, but it's easy because what you do is you lay down the Vipassana. You don't do it on top of this. Now, having said all that, if you learn the metta and you're using it and you're, you're uh, using it to help people, like someone called me tonight and said someone in the family's dying, I want to send it to the house, she's ready to do that. If you have gone to the other people and you can send it to each person and they smile back, you are ready to send it to aunt so-and-so in the hospital in your mind from your house. And there's a good possibility. She might say, I really felt better at eight o'clock at night. And you go, huh? I was practicing from 7.30 to 8.15. And you find out, oh, there's something going on with this is something to do it's not something it's a vibration it's a it's a wave vibration that goes out from the body it's an energy that spreads out and can travel and your intention can send it through to bounce off the firmament and what happened my experience with it can it reach anybody i was shocked i was in my second or third retreat teaching in bali to 50 people and one woman had a lot of trouble doing the practice and uh, I said just keep trying for one more day and then maybe I'll change your practice if you can't do it so she continued to do it and left she could not get her friend to smile she thought she had to make her friend smile you don't make them smile they just all of a sudden smile you know at you in your mind and you see it in your mind's eye you know the other person is smiling or you see them smiling right at you that's what happens anyway she went back to the dharma hall after her interview and about i was in another interview and about 15 minutes later, I got through that. When I went in the next interview, she came running down the stairs again. And I said, what's wrong? What happened? She says, oh, I can't believe this. And I said, well, tell me what happened. I chose my roommate from college from 12 and a half years ago in Texas, Austin, Texas. And I'm in Indonesia in Bali. Okay. And she said, we have not talked at all. And my friend just called me. She said she couldn't understand why she was thinking about me. And she said um, she had to call several of the sorority people that in they were together in college to ask them if they knew where I was. And they told her the phone number and she called the office and the office guy came. It's her center. She built this center. And she said, I can't believe this happened. And she was almost crying. I said, well, don't cry. Go back and do it again. Now start the other people. <laughs> you know, start the other people. And she was so excited. And this woman just started thinking about her. She had no reason to think about her. So you explain to me what happened. And if you're a scientist, come and tell me how to explain it so it, it makes uh, better on the target something. But this happens with people. You know, and I can send it to somebody in a room when a lot of people are upset and they're arguing, I can send it in a, to a room and the whole room calms down. 
and then I walk in the room. Yeah. Or I can go if I know a bunch of people are arguing about what to do next in a meeting in a company and I have to be at that meeting, I, I, I will go to the ladies room probably and smile in the mirror for two or three minutes and then I'll go in there and I'll start letting it flow out. And then everybody calms down and they start discussing things. How does it work? Beats me, I don't know. But the Buddha was a, a peacemaker and he had some good tools. And the thing is, these tools are available to anybody. This is not magic. This is part of what human beings actually have potentially have a potential to do from their energy, but we don't normally use it. Nothing secret about it, nothing weird. So I hope that answered your question, basically. But if you want, if you want to practice just the Vipassana way later on, go ahead, but make sure that your your Brahma, your Brahma Viharas are strong and you know how to send it, you know how to use it and train, and then you can do that the other way if you want to with a group of people. In most cases, our students understand the Vipassana is happening and they don't do it as often that way because that was a harder, coarser. And this is very light, 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 light. And you keep happy and you keep smiling. So that's why I think a lot of people like it because it's so uplifting. And then when, you know, happy joy goes away, what comes in afterwards is what? Is tranquility. Mm -hmm. No, sukha. Um, tranquility. I'm sorry, tranquility. When tranquility fades away, because they're all subject to anicca, you don't get to get them and keep them at all. You see, you can't keep anything and make it stay. Not even the baby. She couldn't do that, but you can't do it with a feeling like this. You see? So when you go through the jhanas and have these blissful kind of experiences, that's okay. They're not dangerous as long as you understand it's coming, it's going to be there, it's going to go away. Don't be sad. Fine. Something else will come up that's nice from it, the tranquility. Then the tranquility goes away and then the, the, uh, the sukha comes up. And sukha is the Buddhist happiness not vibratory, but Buddhist happiness is internal contentment. I know how it works. I'm not afraid anymore of anything. I don't have to, I can leave the future being where it is. I can leave the past being where it is. I can stay here in the present time and I can move along in the present time. Just the present time, it's not heavy. Think about that. Think about how much better you can sleep if you're just with the present time as you go through life. Then when you're finished this task, fine, I'm finished that. Okay, we put another task in there. Now that's the present time. You leave what you did in the morning here. You come to noon, you go home at night. When you're at night, you put the stuff down at the door and you go and hug your husband or your wife and your children and play with the dog and maybe play tennis, who knows? Who knows what you do but the point is the present time isn't heavy see envision this the past is like a huge backpack and you carry it around with you all the time on your back so you're walking around, around leaning over to the front all the time somebody says yeah but what's going to happen next honey what what is going to happen next you're worried about the future. You put a front pack on. Now, when you walk, you're kind of walking like this. You're going, uh -huh, uh, and you're taking steps like that, worried, feeling bad about the past and worried about the future, feeling bad about the past, worrying about the future, you see? And the Buddha comes along or a monk and says, why don't you take that backpack off? You can't do anything about it anymore. You think about that, the weight of it, you put it down. Leave it at home by the door inside. And then somebody else says, you know, you could take that one on the front. You could take that off. And all of a sudden you stand up and you have more energy and you're ready to go for the day and you feel much better. Do you see? That's what he's teaching you. That's what he's showing you. Is there any other questions? Hmm? 
okay, you, Sarah, you're kind of quiet tonight. <laughs> you okay over there? <laughs> Hello, yes. I didn't have the technology sorted at the beginning to ask a question. So oh, okay. <laughs> but it was a really, really lovely talk. Thank you so much. Well, I'm glad we had an opportunity to do it. It's an interesting thing. It's pretty, there's not much to explain if you go slowly enough in doing it, you know, but it's all laid out. And uh, the, uh, there's a Chinese version of this, which explains a lot about their family structure. And they say that they grab a hold of that one. You can go to Suta Central and look where it explains the different versions of it, you know? And so I realized the way they run their families and everything, they really stick to this. So it's very organized, you know? And um, amazing that he had that much for support for people, yeah. So you have any other questions? Hmm? I do have one question. Okay. Do you, do you need to finish the session? Um, no, sure. we're, we're done, we're okay, we're done. Um, my my question is is a probably sounds a very basic one, but um, it was to do with the dancing, and it's something I've I've had in my mind to ask actually for a long a long long time, because dancing I see can happen from very different intentions. Um, one one the one I want to ask about is uh, an expression that I've experienced that where I feel real meta, it's a place where I can experience a natural joy and so I found it to be very healing and it, it, it helps me relax the tensions that I carry, the over controlling uh, and come to a very natural joyful place. So sure. it's a, so that was a, 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 the question is around um, I suppose a blanket sort of direction, no dancing. Nobody said that very significant here. Yeah, he didn't say no dancing. Um, he said that these things can lead to other things. See, the trick to this whole thing is the Buddha didn't forbid things. The more knowledge you have, understanding, you can smell the rose and smell the scent and you can have the dancing play the piano. One of them, I'll, let me tell you this way. One of the most ridiculous things I ever went through in my life was with a student in England, as a matter of fact, who was a second chair cello for a big symphony in London. This is true. And uh, you know, when you are that good at playing an instrument in your life, you must understand musicians, they, they're they sometimes very shy. This is the way they express themselves. This is the way we talk. My voice singing was my way of communicating. We had a joke about me when I came off the stage, I fell apart and you know, I was not so unique. When I was on the stage, it was 100% completely right there with you. And it was in total complete, how could that be the same person? You see, it was my expression, my total expression. For her playing the cello was the way she spoke, the way she, uh, her, it, it touched her heart and everything worked perfectly with the cello. Anyway, she got involved with some Buddhists and the, that Buddhist group, I will not say who, basically said, if you're going to be Buddhist, you can't play that cello anymore. You have to stop. Now, I'm sorry, that was wrong. In fact, uh, she tried to stop and took a sabbatical in her position in the orchestra and she got extremely depressed. And then I found out about it. I went back and said, you have to stop this nonsense. There's nothing in the text that, for instance, that say, this is where we we're all confused, that say you cannot have ceremonies anymore for something else outside Buddhism. There's nothing that says you can't do almost anything as long as you don't crave it and cling it. Here's the danger is craving it and wanting it and not wanting to stop it or wanting to keep it away or something like that. It's the wanting or to get it or not get it, that sort of thing. It's the desire, that's the thing. But remember, okay, let's talk about that for a minute. <laughs> they changed the Four Noble Truths in America and a lot of people are hearing the Noble Truths differently. Instead of there is suffering, uh, they are hearing 
the first noble truth, that life is suffering. The Buddha never said that. He knew there wasn't just suffering and all, all life is not suffering. His own monks, I just read you a description of his, of his own monks. He knew we were the happy ones. He was trying to uplift you and have uplifted joy. He was trying to have you to understand all like all things in moderation is okay, especially in the lay structure. So you have people who are saying, well, I can't smile, I'm a Buddhist now. That's nonsense. You can't uh, celebrate with your neighbors anymore to celebrate Ganesh, for instance, or, or oh, who's the other one with the flute? Do you know who I mean? Uh, you can't celebrate with them anymore because you're a Buddhist. Well, why not? What's wrong with that? As long as you're not, he, what he said about ceremonies was he said, do not take part in rites and rituals, believing they're going to take you to Nibbana. That's the statement. Now look at what happened. It got really messed up, didn't it? Really, really messed up. That's the danger in today's interpretations of Buddhism. And it's very sad because young people aren't going to stand for it because you've taken the life out of this thing. When you start to say, if desire is the cause, for suffering, we should desire nothing if we are a Buddhist. Wait a second, you just spent this whole sutta figuring out how to live as a family and all the stuff about it. Now, where in there did it say that you cannot have any wholesome desire at all? Did it? It didn't, did it? You should desire to do this and desire to succeed at work, desire to have good grades at school, desire for your children to be healthy, desire that your wife is, is happy and you're happy in the family. Do you see what's happening here? But if you were to tell somebody, if I'm a Buddhist, I should never smile anymore. I'm not going to stay. Why would I stay Buddhist? And these, where this is happening and the monks are sometimes saying that, People are don't, they can't take their children to that temple. They don't want to go there. They don't want to hear that nonsense. And that's what it is. It's nonsense. It's not what the Buddha said. It's not what he taught. He taught you to avoid craving, avoid clinging, and understand how they work. He taught you right effort. Look at what has happened with right effort. We can ask a uh, like what, 20 monks in Singapore, I asked 20 monks to tell me what right effort is. And do you know what they said? You have to work very hard if you're a Buddhist. You have to persevere. You have to put time in. You have to meditate so hard if you want to get to Nibbana. You have to do that. And you know what? There's no attainments happening anymore because of that with, with where that's happening. Because that wasn't how you were supposed to be doing it. You were supposed to be allowing it and getting personally out of the way. The atta and anatta is mixed up. Atta means I'm going to, everything, it means this. Atta is interpreted by human beings to mean my whole life is me. It is mine. It is my fault, my, my, myself. Because it is me, it is mine, and it is myself, it is my fault, everything. Not a good sign, not a good sign. Okay, so he says, what would happen if you said everything is impersonal and you watched everything and you helped people where you needed to, but you didn't take anything personally? All I can tell you all here is do that for a day and find out what it's like and keep forgiving anything that comes in your face about anything and Give back loving kindness and compassion is space and actively seeing the other person in front of you who's getting angry at you. That person is hurting in COVID too. That person is stressed out from all these lockdowns too. Just the way you're feeling and other people are feeling. So we have to activate compassion and we have to help people get through this and stuff like that, you see? But they're not yelling at you, by the way. If somebody's yelling at you at work or yelling at you at home, if you look closely, they're yelling at themselves. They're talking to you about as if it's you, but it's about themselves. And they're feeling 
they can't accomplish what they want to accomplish. So when somebody's yelling at you, you think it's coming at you, that's Atta. You're taking it personally. Anatta is that person is living, first of all, in ignorance, ignoring the teaching and not understanding how stuff works. Second, you have the edge, you understand what's happening. Listen even closer if it's a person that's working where you're working and you might notice it really is that the person is talking about themselves and their own frustrations. And then go get tea together. Have some ice cream. <laughs> that's the thing, go have some ice cream together or have some coffee or tea. You see, that's what you do. There's no reason to fight back. Anybody says anything to you, there's an old expression for little children in New York City. <laughs> Sticks and stones will break my bones, but names will never hurt me. You know, that, that's, what, that's the Buddha talking to you, for little kids. The sticks and stones, you can throw them. Sticks and stones might break my bones, but you call me names and yell at me and put me down and make me feel weak or insecure or not confident. That's something's wrong for the other person, not for me. I'm fine. That's what you have to understand. That is what you have to understand. You see? Okay. So I want to thank you all for coming. And... Um, I hope I'll let you know if there's another one about life that we have, and I'll let you know what the uh, items are that are going to be the items that we're teaching. Anybody wants to come, they can, and we might have fun with it. So we had a lot of people attend. I was really happy. You know, it's really nice. Okay, so we say a closing prayer now. Okay, everybody. Yeah. May suffering ones be suffering free, and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and mortals of light and power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.